it. Okay. Oh wait. I gotta I gotta change the view for a second. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't want to. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have a real treat for you tonight. Um, I'll explain a little bit first. I, I found out about this guy from the Art Bell show because I was a big Art Bell fan and I was and it was Dr. Michael Lynch. And he's become a, a fun guest on this show. People like him a lot. People love what he has to say about the paranormal, about ETs, about ufology, about Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, he's done a lot of stuff. He's even talked about the Anunnaki. He encompasses it all. But he's been discovering, he's been doing ghosts for years. And I'm going to talk about his background now. Um, Michael, Dr. Michael Lynch is a paranormal investigator for the past 27 years. He's been investigating UFOs, ghosts, and ancient civilizations, and government conspiracies. Dr. Lynch has had out for the past 14 years a long running radio segment on 97.1 St. Louis, Missouri called Paranormal Tuesdays with guests and talk all about things paranormal. Added to his joint endeavor with Conspiracy Agents podcast show, which has been developed over the past three years dealing with government conspiracies. Dr. Lynch has been on television. He has been on Discovery Channel, Sci-Fi Channel, Fox Family, ABC Family, Destination America, National Geographic, uh, Scariest Places on Earth, MTV Fear, and It's Real. He's also appeared in the documentaries such as The Shadow Worlds, The Haunted Boy, Children of the Grave 2, and Soul Catcher. Wow, that's amazing. So you're actually in movies? You know, I never asked you about that. Yeah, um, I've, I've got a few right here, not that I'm bragging or anything, but the, the latest one I was on was, oops. Oh, by I'm the sorry. way, this is our Halloween. Yeah, this is our Halloween. Yeah, this is a Halloween episode. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My ghost. Okay. So we got a little ghosty here. So it's <laughs> like Halloween. This is my Halloween. Uh, this is the Halloween segment. So make sure I turn it on. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> there was one time when I was very young. I was I was I was very young, and uh, my mom took a, an old bed sheet and actually cut eyes out of it. And I was a ghost. I was a ghost for that Halloween. And I kept tripping and stepping on the bed sheet and kept tearing it. And by the end of the night, there was like these little tears and stuff, you know, as I would, you know, cross people's yards. And it, it was more hilarious. I think people just laughed at me more than any, then they were frightened, you know, but, but I was, I was young and the days were different, you know. Time was different back in those days. Back and when we were young, I mean, I'm I'm no I'm no I'm no I'm no toddler. I'm I'm 41 years old. I remember trick or treating when we were young, and it was just like a it was a different time then, you know. I guess different, I different guess, psychology, different psychology. I think. Yeah. Uh, at all. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love the nostalgia though, you know. Going back, that's why I will listen to old Art Bell shows like around this time of year. I listen to his Ghost to Ghost. Remember when he would do the Ghost to Ghost shows oh. where. He would have people call in and tell their ghost stories for like hours on end. Oh, yeah. He would do like five hour shows. I know. I, I would listen to it. And he would, you know, normally do the news up front on the very beginning of the shows. He'd do like the world news or whatever, some hot topic. And then when he did the ghost to ghost, he didn't do that. He just said, call me up. And back in those days, you know, he would come on about 11 and in the central time zone. It would be like 11 o'clock, 12. 12 midnight he would come on and I would listen to it almost at five o'clock in the morning and I would just laugh I would just you know, not laugh I would just lay there in bed you know so scared I couldn't go to sleep so yeah those were those were a different time man that was just it was it was, was just, interesting stuff like well what after you're investigating paranormal for 27 years why would you say people why are these two worlds uh interchanging like the the, the world of the alive and the world of the dead and what why does that happen and like what happens yeah. when we die and like i have so many questions right. but uh, yeah there, there's a myriad of questions 90 percent, 90 percent, come from a near-death experience okay um we have developed you know equipment and tools to see entities to see consciousness but the the information the information even in the bible even in the old testament new testament it all comes from a near-death experience point of view. And when you read the Bible, um, there are many occasions to where uh, kings will go to a psychic and ask for advice from, from spirits. 
and as well as the description of the afterlife. Jesus uh, talks a lot about uh, there are many mansions for you. There are many places in heaven designed just for you. And that is very interesting because there have been many atheists that have died and had the near death or death experience and returned. And they claim that it was nothing but love. They didn't see any hell. They didn't see any, anything but love and angels and the energy of the creator. And in many cases, that is what's written down is this experience. Now, do they have any proof? No. But after a thousand or two thousand people do this, and it's written down, and Raymond Moody uh, wrote the first real book on it. He was the first doctor that really took it kind of like, well, is this an illusion? Is this something going on in the mind? Is it hypoxia? Is people just dying and they're hallucinating on on endorphins and and uh, lack of oxygen? You know what I'm saying? Uh, so Raymond Moody kind of took, started the the, the note taking. But if you go back further than that, in the um, archives of the Vatican, there are many of these stories written down. And they're not, they're kind of like being claimed, are they miracles or, or are they just an experience? And the Vatican will say, oh, this is just an experience. It's not a miracle. So that doesn't go into the miracle uh, filing cabinet, goes over to the experience filing cabinet. But that's how it all started because people would, would die virtually at home or, or whatever. And the Catholic priest would be called to give the last rites and they would give the last rites or orthodox, orthodox Jews and Jew, Judaism does the same thing. Hinduism does the same thing. Uh, Buddhism in a way, and then and also Taoist, the, the priest will come while you're on the verge of death and then they'll, they'll prepare you for the afterlife. Well, um, Many times they would die or come close to death, and then they would awaken again. And when they would wake, when they became awoke, um, they would be almost normal. And that would be a shock to them, a shock to the priest. And then they would start talking about all these angels and pearly gates and this long line to get in. Now, um, there's a couple of people out there who think that all this started in the 1880s with the Fox sisters. Well, that's not correct. There are two accounts, well, there's one account before the time of Jesus that uh, Plato writes about in his um, epic of the Republic of Ur. And Ur was the son of a king. And we see this kind of in um, Lord of the Rings kind of, kind of vibe. It's kind of a Lord of the Rings kind of vibe. All these kingdoms sent their soldiers to fight in this war. And this, the prince had to go as well. Well, in the fight, he gets killed. I guess. And so they pick up his body after the battle, they pick up his body and they, they, want, they want to take it back to the king. So they, they start this long procession and they take, they take him all the way back to the king and they lie him down and they say, um, your son was, was a glorious uh, fighter in the battle, and, um, but he died, you know, and here he is. And the king pulls off the, the shroud or the cover and looks at him and says, uh, oh, my, you know, my son is dead. We'll have to prepare for the, for the burial. Now, this took about 10 days from the time of the battle till they got to the, the kingdom. So he had been somewhere for 10 days, comatose, uh, dead. We don't really ten know. Day, a 10 day near death. Yes, 10 days. Ten I've never days. heard that. That's wow. That's wow. Yeah, well, the funeral took two days. So on the 12th day, I don't know if there's any significance in that because they didn't have our calendar. You know, they, they weren't going by our, by our time of the, the year. So um, he, he woke up during the funeral ceremonies and he woke up and he's, you know, and this is, okay, this starts a whole, a whole thing because the first thing when he wakes up, he goes, I can't. I'm parched. I need I need wine to drink, and I need food, and so it, this is where we get the idea of a hungry ghost. And the Day of the Dead down in Mexico is that's where they take El Dia de los Muertos, right? Yeah, they take uh, they take food that they've prepared, and main, mainly it's a special food like cornbread or maize or whatever. And they go down full meal, and the people have a picnic right there to the gravesite in case Aunt Martha, Uncle Bob. 
comes out of the grave, he'll be thirsty and he'll be hungry. If you feed the ghost, he'll go back to the grave and he'll be okay. Well, in Ur's case, he actually got up and, well, he was, he was wounded. So I guess I, somehow it healed. But anyway, um, they said, where have you been? You know, how did this happen? And he tells them of a story where he was standing in line with his other soldiers from, that had died. And they were all waiting to go uh, to this man who was at the end of the line. And there were two roads or two things going on. One was a stairway that went down, another stairway that goes up. And uh, we hear this called Jacob's Ladder, where there is something in the Old Testament where a gentleman who falls asleep and he sees angels rising and descending on this ladder, very similar to Ur. Almost Ur has probably, probably started that, that frame of mind, that idea. So Ur says, I'm standing in line with, with my friends, my comrades who have fallen on the battlefield, and we're all going to die. I mean, we've all decided that we're dead. And when they get to the end of the line or to this gentleman, um, the gentleman will decide what to do. Well, before he gets to that gentleman, uh, an, an angel, a man dressed in white, comes up to him and pushes him out of the line. And he says, you have to go back. It's not your time. And Ur was totally uh, confused. He was totally confused. He says, are we living or are we dead? And the man says, oh, no, you're you're living, but you're not mortal. And so Ur doesn't understand spirituality at all. You know, because back in those days, it was pretty David rough. Blue, yeah. yeah, pretty rough. And even to have a funeral back in those days was only left to the kings and the pharaohs and, and things like that. So, um, so, the, so the man says, here, take my hand. And he starts walking uh, to the back of the line, you know, uh, away from the, his soldiers and his friends. And he says, he says, tell your father what has happened here and um, tell him that all, everyone, everyone on earth or whatever will be in this line at one point in their in their cycle of life and wow. so and so the next thing you know he wakes up and he's telling you know he's like oh man he goes you wouldn't believe what i've you know and so everyone writes this off as some type of hallucinogen uh, he's just hallucinating you know lack of oxygen you know he had wounds and gashes and, and maybe he was just, they could have said it was yeah. but, but yeah. how could he how could somebody say everybody on earth will experience this it doesn't why would they bring up earth but not in his brain right no right. It, he was too simplistic for that. You know what That's I mean? Right. So, so, so somewhere down the road, uh, every planet in our solar, our, our galaxy, our universe, every planet will have like a life form. And no matter what planet they're from, they're going to be in that line, you know, down the road. And so <laughs> Ur tells a story. And then it's also recited again by his, um, his, his company, his friends and relatives kind of spread the story around. Well, about a thousand years, you know, 600 years later, we have this guy named Jesus and he kind of does the same thing. You know, uh, he's dead for three days and he, he rises and, and all this other stuff. So we get this idea of the afterlife, but the idea of what they experienced, what they saw is what is written down. And then that's how it is built. Even the, even the Egyptians had this uh, idea of weighing your heart and on okay, you got on a scale, right? Yeah. But the Babylonian says uh, the most uh, important thing is a heart of gold. If you have a heart of gold, um, you know you you would be that you'll rise to the to you'll soar in the heights. You'll be the greatest thing ever. So if you take a heart of gold and put it on the scale with a feather, the heart's going to be heavier. You know, even in carrots. Yeah. Uh, but the idea was that, you know, depends what, what uh, region you're from and what society you're from. That is what's the most important. Uh, here in St. Louis, there's a place called Cahokia Mounds. And Buried was a king, and he was very wealthy, um, and he had seashells. And these seashells were their currency. And scattered around his grave was the seashells, was his almost his fortune, okay? Where, and then where, we have, where was he from? Where, where was this king from? I mean, he was buried in, in St. Louis? Oh, next to St. Louis called Cahokia, Cahokia, Illinois. 
And it was a king? Yeah, yeah he was a king. There are several from Mayan. Atlantis or, or do you think oh, no, no. It was, it was a Mayan uh, colony. It was kind of oh, a, wow, a, that's, Mon, that's a Mayan. amazing. That's yeah, the Mayans amazing. Yeah, uh, branched out. They branched all over America. And even the Cahokia uh, branched out. And they went in segments all the way to Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And wow. that's where the seashells came from. So an artisan would make an arrowhead or a bow or whatever, and then they would trade it. Well, what happens is they get into trouble because things don't equal, you know, they don't, they don't, they're not equal. I put in 10 hours of work and I, I get nothing, you know. So uh, they, they turned their currency into seashells and they went down to Fort Walton Beach, Florida or Destin, Florida, and collected seashells, ground them down, and then passed them up toward back to Cahokia uh, as financial uh, tender, as tender, okay? And so this, this king is buried in a grave. Well, where do we hear something like that uh, someplace else? Ancient Greek, uh, they put the, the coins on the eyes to pay the ferryman. Yeah. The river sticks. And so you started to see kings or, and people that died took their wealth with them, like the pharaohs, like uh, Tutankhamun and all this other stuff, because they had to pay the ferryman, more or less. They had to pay death or whatever to go into to heaven. But these are the stories that have accumulated over thousands of years, thousands of years of men's history. And those things are put into what we call text or books, and then they're passed on uh, as a glimpse of the afterlife. Uh, there were many people back in the 20s and 30s that would have a near-death experience because they would be on the job accident. Someone would fall from a great height. Someone would be poisoned. You know, uh, during the 30s, during Prohibition, uh, there was a lot of moonshine and the moonshine would either make you go blind or kill you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so that's where they got the cocktail juice to, you know, hide the, hide the copper uh, taste was to put in lemon juice or lime and things like that. So when you're yeah. drinking moonshine out of a, out of a bad copper still, you know, you, you see. So, so the idea was that uh, even in ancient Egypt and in ancient uh, Mesopotamia, they would, they would put beer in with the uh, dead person, the, the, the king or the prince or whatever, there'd be beer there. And they always talked in, in Egypt about the ka, the ka, the second self, the, the shadow image. And this refers again to the spirit. It, it's your subconscious, it's your conscious mind, your, your morality, all in this ka. And so Isn't when you the are- the ka and the ba? The ka and the ba is it? Is right. It, is but it, in China, it's called karma. karma. Oh, they put the two together. That's right. And so in ancient China, you have karma. And what does the karma do? It kind of directs you in your life so that maybe you'll be on the good side, or maybe you won't, depending on your karma. You know, it depends how I treat you or you treat me. <laughs> uh, that's how karma works, you know. And so, and so the pharaohs are saying, okay, to his subjects, when I die and you don't put my possessions with me, there'll be a curse put on your head. That's called karma law, you know, law of karma. And so when they get to Tutankhamun's grave and they see this big seal and it says, whoever opens this, breaks this seal, opens this tomb, <laughs> you know, the death upon you or something like that. Okay. Well, John Carter was just, he didn't care. I mean, this was his whole, his whole life. So he just cranks that open, you know? So anyway, um, they always would put these death seals on there because that would be your karma or it would affect your caw, which was your afterlife. Now, a lot of people argue with me on that uh, point of view, but it's the same, no matter what civilization you go to, it's almost exactly the same thing. If you don't treat me right or don't treat your citizens right, if you're the king, then you'll go to a bad place. You know, all that will come on top of you. Well, that's a good idea to keep people in line uh, so they don't become thieves or steal sacred objects or whatever. But in the end game, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in the near-death experience, everyone does the same thing. They see a, a life review. They see, um, they see what they've done wrong. And if they could do it 
over again if they would, if they could, then they would get a second chance. A lot of times they don't, they, they say, no, I don't think I, I could do it any better, you know? And so they just, you know, they don't go back to their bodies, they just go on. But um, Daniel Brinkley, I did a whole study on him and Daniel Brinkley is an amazing person. I, I, mean, I remember he used to be on Art show back in the day. Yeah. When yeah. Oh yeah, Art loved Daniel, yeah. Oh yeah, now Daniel's died like four times. And so each time he gets a little bit more of what he's supposed to do. So, so, so there's an angel there and says, okay, Daniel, um, since we can talk to you now pretty well, uh, this is what you've got to do next. And then, you know, and he goes, okay, you know, and then they go, okay, we're going to send you back to your body. And I've met a, a girl who had three near-death experiences. And each time she talked to relatives that had died before her and they told her all about her life what was going to happen with her life and things and things of this nature that would only affect her. And so a lot of information that near-death experiencers get is for them personally. It's their personal information, not unless they ask, like, where's my family? And uh, where, where am I? And things like that. So there was an atheist. I, think, I forgot his last name. His first name was George. And he's on YouTube and he's just saying, well, I was an atheist all my life and I was angry all my life. And I got in a lot of trouble most of my, most of my life. And he said, I died. He died in the hospital and he went directly into heaven. And he said, there is nothing but love. There was absolutely no judgment from the creator. And that um, the creator asked him, do you think, uh, after you've seen all this, do you think you'd go back and have a better life? And he goes, oh yeah, definitely, because you know God's the backup. You know, he's 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 making all this happen. You know, so he goes back to his body, and he, when he comes to, he's on the floor of his hospital room, and the nurses are there. They're, they're getting ready to get, you know use the paddles on him, and he wakes up, and he is reciting the Lord's prayer. And as an atheist, he he really didn't know the lord's prayer but he said an angel was telling it to him as he awoke and so he's just reciting it so we have a society here in st louis that meets about once a year called the near-death experiencers and 20 30 people show up almost every year and they'll talk about their experiences and after you go back you know through history and current literature you'll find out that the spiritual experience is the main, uh, the main avenue of, of a lot of mysticism and a lot of things like that. And um, this atheist asked the creator, said, what about Adolf Hitler? Didn't you punish him? Didn't he go to hell? And the creator says, no, no, he didn't. Um, he, he forgave himself. Now, this is where we get into demons. This is where we kind of get into demons. But if even Adolf Hitler could forgive himself, um, then that would be enough. And then Adolf Hitler was reincarnated as a miner in Poland. Um, I think he's in his 80s now. But, um, but this but is was, where... He was reincarnated, really? Yeah, yeah, he was re reincarnated, yeah. Uh, I had a, a personal case where uh, a friend of, of mine came to me with his mother, and they didn't tell me his father had died. And so I um, asked my guides, I said, well, you know, what's happened here? And they said, well, the death, there's a death in the family. And I go, oh, it's, it's his father. I said, oh my God. So I go, okay. So I said, what, uh, where is his father now? He wants to know if his father is in heaven or the afterlife or, you know. And it kept, the answer was so bizarre, I couldn't even fathom it. It was like, no, he's been reincarnated on another planet in another body. And you know that planet, meaning scientists on the earth know of that planet. Well, when I told the, uh, the mother this, she goes, I just saw in the news, this planet we discovered. And she gave me the number. And I, then I asked my guides, I said, is that uh, the planet? And they go, yes, it is. That's why she saw that news broadcast. Wow. That's how small the universe really is. You know, I mean, I mean, okay. So the entire universe, everything in our universe 
is connected. It's all connected. We're all connected to the same source of energy. And that energy, whether it be spiritual, whether it be electricity, whether it be computer software programs or the internet, it is information. And that information is us. We are the information. So God takes, he'll, when we are born biologically, God takes something of himself and he looks at our DNA and he tries to fit this really big spiritual thing of, of himself into that DNA because it's got to resonate the right frequencies for that spirit to be in the right DNA. Okay, and then that's how it's kind of done. That's kind of how it's done. So we are uh, vessels of a larger spiritual entity. So this that, all is like a simulation somewhat? Like, uh, what did you say? Yes, like, yes, a, yeah, it's yeah. like a game? Like, it's all like an information it, game? Like a well, you know, you can call it the matrix, but even the game has rules. And so we have rules like gravity, and we have rules like uh, death is, you know, death or whatever, decay. Particle decay is the only uh, element of time that we have. So we don't have time by the sun or a sundial or we just, that's a construct. We just created that. So 1970 or 1980 or 2000 is just a number that we've created. And in the Jewish calendar, it's like 57, 28 or something like that. I might be a little bit off on that. But anyway, so, so everyone has a different, slightly different calendar, slightly different timeline, but particle decay is the only thing that we go by that is actually uh, time because it decays linear, at a linear. certain rate. It yeah. decays at a certain rate, you know. So if I'm decaying at a certain rate, you know. I'm saying uh, everything will decay at a certain rate, and then that's how we get to particle time. But in the energy, it never decays. It is transferred. It never is destroyed, and it vibrates through the entire cosmos. It, you know, the entire universe is made of energy, and so our sun gives off energy. Uh, supernovas give off energy. Um, we can go on, you know, black holes try to suck it in, but they give off x-rays. And Energy bounces around in our universe so prevalently, so much of it, that in, my, okay, just, just me waving my hand, I'm moving electrons around uh, in the air. And so through like static electricity, just think of static electricity. Yeah. Okay. But, but when I move my hand, I'm actually moving electrons around and oxygen molecules and a bunch of other things, you see. So energy is bouncing around from everywhere, just everywhere. So for us to uh, think about it, okay. So, okay, let me just do a little demonstration. The sun on a hot day uh, lets off neutrinos and photons and all that good stuff. And then it comes through our atmosphere and the atmosphere kind of changes it a little bit, you know. Um, but my skin will say, oh, I'm getting sunlight. Well, for self-preservation, it creates a tan. It's melanin. The melanin, the cells receive something to make them want to tan, okay? Now, when I get an X-ray for my tooth or whatever, I don't get any melanin response. So there's something in the photonic nature of our sun giving us, our bodies, information through its energy. You see? That's amazing. And our bodies respond to it. That's okay. amazing. That's okay. Am I never, I never knew I, that. And I never would have thought of that. Like in a, in a I, thousand years. I, 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 that's so amazing. I like, get this. It really is. Here's a, here's the craziest story you'll ever hear. And, and yeah, you know, people call me. Mr. Crazy here sometimes because I come up with some really big ones. But you're a doctor uh, though. And you're, yeah, well, you, you yeah. know your stuff. Like, you, yeah. you mean so, so there's a, okay, I'm, I'm not going to say this very loud. I, there's a psych ward in a hospital uh, downtown, you know, one of the yeah. big hospitals has a psych ward. The whole level up is a psych ward. Okay. Well, a friend of mine called me and she was a nurse on that ward. Okay. She's been a nurse there about 10 years. And then she was, and then she was saying, you know, Mike, she goes, some days everything is nice and calm. Everybody takes their medication. Everybody sits around. They play some checkers. They watch a little TV. And there's nothing going on. And then suddenly she said, 
Oh, like one day she'll go in for her shift and they'll be up jumping around, ripping pillows, fighting with each other. And, and I go, well, that just, I said, that's just very interesting. So I pu pulled up the sun graph, the graph of the sun. So it tells you your sunspots, your infrared and geomagnetic blasts. And I go, okay, tell me when the next time they do that. And she called me like a couple of weeks later. She goes, Mike, they're going crazy. And so I went on the G-scope, which is from the sun, which it determines this electromagnetic uh, pulse we get. And that pulse was making those patients crazy. And no matter wow. what, no matter what pill they took, no matter what pill they took, they were bouncing off the walls. They were, they were sitting there. I said, can you give them some Thor, uh, Thorazine? Can you give them? And she said, we have given them everything in the book pill and injection and they're still bouncing off the walls and i said well it's electromagnetic pulse from our sun affecting their brain and that's what's causing it it was giving and, them energy it was giving yeah. them energy. oh it was it was it was scrambling you know they were scrambling them up yeah okay so back in the old days back in the old days you know uh maybe you were young enough um, you would take your AM car, you'd be driving your car, you have an AM radio station on, right? You'd be listening to Arkham yeah, yeah. whatever, late at night. Well, you know, when you pull up, back in my day, when I pulled up to a stop light, there'd be all these power lines, phone lines and power lines all around. And my AM radio would go, you know, static, static, static. Yeah. Okay. That's enough energy to get into my head. So people sit there and they're driving down the street. All these emotions are going through their head. Like I'm late. I, I got to get ahead of this guy. I don't like him. You know, road rage. We call it road rage now, but it's not. It's a little electromagnetic signals going through our head. What is the best tool to look at someone's brain? It's an MRI, electromagnetic resonance, scanning your brain section by section. Wow. Okay. And they tell you, they play music and they tell you, if you get claustrophobic or sick or whatever, you just let us know because we'll be talking to you. You know, you'll hear music or whatever because they don't want people to freak out. It's not that it's claustrophobic. It is that there's an electromagnetic donut sitting there. There's a big donut just going through your, you know, going through every phase of your brain and scanning your whole brain. And people don't realize that much power, you know, can make your, can change your uh, biochemicals in your brain, especially your brain waves. Okay. Wow. So, so, so anyway, we're inundated. We're inundated. Look at 5G. Look at 2.4 on your cell phone. Look up, look on your house phone. If it's cordless, it'll be 2.4 gigahertz or giga, yeah, gigahertz. You have internet that's 5G now going to eight. We, we've got everything just pumping and pumping energy all around us. AM, FM radio, uh, HD radio. We, we just, we're just pumping it, okay? And, and people don't realize that that is the only way. Broadcast was the only way since 1930, okay? And then we got into the 20th century back in the 70s and 80s. They said, we can put this on a narrow bandwidth, you know? Thank you, you know thinking yeah. a little bit wiser, but anyway, we in inundate, we inundate everything. Do you, think, do you think all the energy, like the energy inventions, like, and well, um, do you think all the energy inventions, like the internet and everything energy related and all the technology we've come with over the past in the 20th century, since we've gotten older is, do you think that that might've been alien influence or do you think that's all oh, human yeah. minds? Definitely, okay. I have Nikola Tesla on this hand, okay? I got Mark, okay, I got Nikola Tesla and Marconi, and I've got uh, Westinghouse, and I've got Thomas Edison, okay? They had stone knives and bear skins. I mean, they were, they were doing stuff, I mean, full power, DC, AC, they were, the competition was fierce, okay? And that competition, continued up into the 1940s where we had crystal and cathode ray tubes we had tubes that would fit in the back of your tv or radio that would actually be 
the electronics of those things. In 1947, hmm, there was a, well, 1945, let me go back. 1945, there was a crash in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, a crash where a priest had to get up and go and, and give the last rites to three pilots that were child size and really green. Wow. Yeah. And in 1945, they took that ship and tore it apart. And they created the MJ, MJ-12 documents from that wreckage. At the time, so it wasn't. It wasn't only, from Roswell. It was from that. Right, that one. It was. No. From, oh, well. right. Now in world in World War II, in the uh, I would say the Argonne Forest. I may, I may be wrong on that. It could be the Black Forest, but I think it was the Argonne Forest. There was another crash of another UFO, and the Nazis got a hold of that, took it, tore it apart, and they said, "Hey, if we can just figure this out, well." Okay, remember, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have it with me right now, but um, if you looked at copper telephone lines, they were in tubes about this big, about this big, and there'd be a hunt, there'd be a thousand pieces of copper wire running through that, and that was your telephone system, okay? All of that was replaced to one single glass fiber called fiber optics. So 1,500 phone calls in digital signal via light could pass through and do the same thing as this humongous network of copper wiring. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So in 1945, they got it. Okay, the, the Nazis got a ship um, in the 42, I think it was 42. In 45, there was a Cape Girardeau incident then in 47, there was Roswell. And so it goes on. And what happens under Project Paperclip? All those Nazis came to America. And then they, what did they say? Oh, yeah, we were been talking to aliens for a long time. And they yeah. told us how to get here. They told us how to, what to build and how to build it. Yeah. And, and they all like, uh, the Americans go, well, I think these guys are drinking their own moonshine, their own rocket fuel, because... Um, you know, that doesn't make any sense to us and until 47, because when 45 happened in Cape Girardeau, it was buried. They just buried it. They said, we don't know this technology. We don't have the science to understand it. So they just warehoused it. I got to tell another little story uh, on the same psychology. Um, Howard Hughes built the Spruce Goose. It was one of the largest water-based airplanes in the world. Okay. And um, he got a government contract to build it. Okay. But after he tests flew it and, and realized the technology was just not going to make it with this large of an aircraft. Now, if it had jet engines, I'm sure he had, would have no problem. But with prop engines and the way it was designed, it was just not going to work. So what did he say? He told Noah, his uh, accountant, he goes, I was Noah, he goes, how much would it cost to put this in a hangar? And Noah says, well, we have to build the hangar. He said, we'll do it. Well, let's do it. So the spruce goose sat in a hangar for almost 30, 40 years. Wow. Okay, just sitting, waiting for the technology to catch up to it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you have a UFO from another planet, uh, UAP from another planet. You can't even read its writing, but yeah. you tear it apart. Ooh, this is really light metal. I wonder what's called. We'll call it Wolferum. Wolferum. And the Americans will call it Aluminum. Oh, wow. Yeah. The Nazis came up with Wolfram. Whoa, that's mm, where do they get that? I wonder. I wonder. Okay, so you go with fiber optics. It replaces all the telephone communication lines. You go with with uh, broadband, cell towers, um, you know, something three foot long that can project to the curvature of the earth 20 miles, and you pick it up and use it with your cell phone. You just pick it up. And yeah, I, I dial, I can call you. You're in a totally different state. You can be on a, you can be in Alaska and I can be in uh, uh, Chile, South, South America and still pick up my cell phone and call you. It wasn't always like, yeah, it wasn't always no. like it until recently. No. I mean, so, so everything had, okay. So it was like, okay, I'm going to give you a penny and you go, oh, great, Mike. I'm going to save that. 
So you put it in your bank account. And then next time I give you a dime and you go, ooh, that's, that's pretty cool. And so that every time I see you, I give, start keeping, giving you larger and larger bills until you're up to about $1,000. And, and then I say, what are you going to do with that $1,000? And they, they go, I'm going to take over the world. See, because nobody else has that $1,000. And so that's what they did. Uh, Bell Labs yeah. got the first stuff from the Roswell and the Cape Girardeau incident. There's guys sit down. Lucent Technologies, if you're old enough, you'll, you'll remember Lucent Technologies. Lucent is Bell Labs. It was Bell Labs straight out. And, and what was their logo? It was a big circle, you know, circling the earth. AT&T's logo is what? It's the earth. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're going to take over the earth and they could do it. They could just do it. But if it wasn't for petroleum, telecommunication, wasn't for, for petroleum, um, okay, I'm sorry. If it wasn't for petroleum, that would be the only other thing on the on the market, except for communications, telecommunications. Telecommunications is bigger and broader in every country. There is a, a billion Chinese running around cell phones. They had cell phones before they had cell towers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I had the, for some of the first cell, and if you're old enough, okay, I got an old, where I worked, I got an old Motorola. It was like the second or third generation, and it was like a flip phone but it had Motorola on it, right? Yeah. There, was, there were two numbers on the back. One was like a SIM number, okay? And there was another number, and I forgot, it was a PN number, P uh, slash, and I forgot what it was. Or IMEI, like, is that IMEI? Yeah, it could be IMEI now, but it wasn't at the time. And that second number was a military number. It was a military issue, because Motorola got the funding from the government to develop the cell phone. Wow, that's amazing. So, so Al Gore is sitting there saying, I made the internet. No, Al, you found the money to, to fund some guys in, the, in a military barracks because they were tired of basic and they developed HTML. Wow. Yeah. See what I'm saying? So, so here's a, okay, here, here's a million dollars, guys. Go out there and build the internet. And they built it with, with nothing. I mean, scrap. I mean, they, they, they had to have been crazy like me or geniuses because- HTTP, the language, went through the, the whole United States so fast. It beat Linux, it beat Basic, it beat uh, Fortran. It, it, it took Cobalt right off the market. Cobalt was a language, gone. Fortran was another language, gone. And then they were down to one, Basic and HTTP, <laughs> HTML. You see hey, what I'm saying? I, I, I learned HTML and I learned DHTML in college. Yeah. I remember okay. that. And I learned okay. JavaScript. Like, and I learned right. C++. Okay. But I, rem but I remember learning about this like a little okay. bit. Yeah. Okay. Now the technology had to go faster and, and carry more dynamics. Now my, my camera is, uh, I bought a new camera. So it's uh, it's HD camera now. And we're putting it through fiber optic cable, transmitting it through satellites, back down to you on this computer software. You see what I'm saying? Every yeah. step in the, in the link is now complete. So, so just because I have a piece of fiber optic glass does not necessarily mean I know what to do with it. Uh, Colonel Corso talks about this. He goes, it was on my desk. It was in my, I had a drawer. He, he said, I had this big drawer and it had six filing cabinets and each one of them was night vision. <laughs> you know, he didn't know what it was. Kevlar, you know. It was bulletproof and had this metal in it. We could bend it, but we, we couldn't break it, you know. Uh, so Corso sit there with all this stuff in his drawer. And, and Truman was the one who came in and said, about the Cape Girardeau incident, Truman came in and said, uh, bury it, man, bury it. Wow. Just, just, just warehouse it because we, we're not there yet, okay? But the guys, you know, we're, we're, we mimic, humans mimic a lot. We're pretty plucky you kind of show us something and you think we can change it improve it but we needed something else we needed a server we need lasers you know alan parsons had to develop the laser you see what i'm saying to go yeah. through the fiber optics and when they had to do it fast enough you know to communicate so um there had been a lot of things to go along now we can credit humans you know i can put my name on whatever i want you know uh, Max Planck, Albert Einstein, uh, 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 you know, uh, 
Ferme, uh, right out there with uh, Louis Pasteur. You know, we 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 can think. We were we have reasoning powers, powers to reason. But sometimes to go from theoretical to practical is a quantum leap. I mean, it's a jump. You know, it's a jump, and that is what man did from 1947 to 1952 made that quantum leap now there's a there's a uh in the movie 1940 uh something i forgot 1942 i don't i forget what it was but it was about the japanese trying to invade uh, the west coast of california you know trying to invade california and the first thing there was they got a uh, they had to steal a, a radio that had uh, American news broadcasts, but they didn't have the same frequencies. So they had to steal this big radio and they're trying to get this big radio <laughs> into the submarine <laughs> and they can't do it. You know, it won't fit in the hole. And they go, we got to make this smaller. We got to make this smaller. And so they, so in the rest of the movie, they're taking that radio apart and mm -hmm. making it smaller so that they can get it into the submarine. And that's like, that's where their genius comes in. They're, they live in an overcrowded society and everything has got to be small. You know, has got to be uh, technologically advanced, you know, and we wear watches today that we saw in Star Trek, uh, the motion picture, you know, you, Captain Kirk would press on his watch and say, okay, or her, give me the, the, the data codes, you know, and we have that now. We can do the internet, we can make phone calls, video calls, all from our watches. Now, I'm not How saying much of that. Hollywood do you think was based on, of like, do you, I mean, because I heard the government had, like, some oh. of these whistleblowers say the government had the internet for 50 years, and then, well, um, and then they had they a long, they're, they, they've yeah. had it for long, they've had it for long, longer than us, and that oh. a lot of these Hollywood movies yeah. are based on stuff that, like, you know, like Star Trek, our future might be more like Star Trek, like, right? Yes. Or, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, uh, they may have it. I mean, they may have it, but it's kind of like uh, Bell. You know, he picks up the phone and he says, "Watson, come here." Well, Watson's in the next room. You know, see what I'm saying? It's it's limited. It's very limited. Yeah. And they they will not release it to the public until they can profit from it. I mean, there's a profit margin here that everyone's got to understand is that they can't figure out a way to sell it to us. It just sits there on the table. Yeah. Wow. Talk about, okay. Yeah, I'm going to get into uh, about, some how. Uh, we're talking about old stuff. We're talking about some old stuff here, okay? So so we'll, I'll show you my progress. I'll show you how I got started in this. Okay. Everybody, okay, if you're my age and you were younger, you would watch Mission Impossible. Uh, Deslu Productions uh, manufactured Mission Impossible, and you'd watch Peter Graves and his cast of characters. But in the very beginning of the show, um, Peter Graves would get his information by one of these. That's a, that, those are, I remember those. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's like, good morning, Mr. Phelps. Uh, there is a third world dictator killing millions of people. We want you to go and assassinate him. And, you know, of course, you have the impossible mission for us and blah, blah, blah. And then you see the smoke come up, right? Yeah. Well, this is how, this is the smaller version of the big reel to reel that was there, but this was, again was made. Uh, in Japan by Lloyd's and they got it uh, smaller so you could actually carry it around with you and when you went on ghost investigations or paranormal investigations at the time you'd have a microphone and you would hold it up and you would interview your um, clients or you would try to get an EVP and there were many people that had these uh, in, back in the day this one still works but it, uh, it had these today and this was their soul sole piece of equipment to do paranormal investigations and if they got wow. a voice oh man yeah it's better than the fox sisters because the fox sisters only got knocks we well, got a voice okay so berkeley gets involved and uh that college out there in the east coast i forgot the name anyway that wasn't lawrence livermore because those guys were all deep in the military special ops so it was you know but it was something like that Anyway, they, they got a bunch of these and they went out and they started to do paranormal investigations. Why? Because if we could weaponize the paranormal back in the early 60s, I mean, that's where their, their head was, um, to develop psychic abilities or be able to weaponize it, um, they would use tools like this to do it because we didn't have really, the we had just the beginning of EEG, which is for the brain, and uh, cephalocardiograms for the heart. So we could understand you know, the rhythm, rhythm of the heart, the brain waves, and the mind. 
Um, so this was like the tool uh, of choice uh, for that time. Okay, so everyone goes, okay, well, we're, we're limited in our, you know, we're limited in our technology and, and this is. So there might be a couple of little guys out there who uh, are, you know, who my age and, and they, they may have seen one or, or held one, but um, they don't, um, they probably don't have it anymore. They probably threw it away for a CD or a cassette tape. A cassette tape was like revolutionary to me in my day. So, so now we, we have uh, things like this, which are pretty big and bulky, but they're still lighter and um, they can see and record. So you get EVPs and visualization. You can see this is a high definition. You get an entity on that? You'll see, a, you'll see a ghost? Oh, yeah, yeah. I do, I do like 90% of my work on this. Uh, Built-in is a, 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 I'm sorry, is a laser th thermometer. So I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot you and see what your temperature is. And uh, let me see. Can I get it? Yeah, I got it right there. Okay. So the uh, temperature of my camera is 90, 40, oh, 84 degrees. Okay, that's pretty warm. But, but at least I can do that. And I can record um, EVPs with my Zoom, my Zoom up here, which is in stereo, or, or, or there's four tracks or two tracks, you know, whatever you want, or however you want to do it. And then it goes on to a, a little DVR. Um, oops, sorry, little DVR here, so it can record visual and audio at the same time. And and you see, we've gotten a little bit more bulky with it. But it does an amazing job. It just does would you amazing. be able to see if there's like an entity behind me right now or something like that? Oh, no, I can't do it. I have to be there in person. I'd have to physically be there. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I just, I, I'm just curious about it. It's so interesting. It's yeah. so, it, but like so, the fact that we're able to, because I've seen, like, I don't know much about um, paranormal investigations, but I've seen, oh, like, oh, yeah. uh, the pictures where they showed, like, the entity stick figures on camera and stuff like that. Like, what is Yeah, that oh, that's, that's from the, that's from the Connect. If you have an Xbox, you'll know what the Connect is, you know. But uh, I don't do it that way. That's just bogus. I mean, it's bogus. Yeah. What what what's, what does an real entity look like? Does it look like us? What we look like? Somebody no. told it. You'll have four or five different variations. One is an entity can be a full-bodied mimic apparition, meaning it looks just like me, but I'm transparent. Okay. Yeah. Or it can be a mist. It can be a black mist, a light mist. It can just be a mist. Okay, and then the others are orbs. It can be a large orb the size of a beach ball, basketball, and go all the way down to a hardball size. Now, I got to tell you a story about that. So remind me if I forget, Leif. If I forget, tell me, remind me about the hardball-sized orbs. Yeah. But most of our consciousness, as soon as it leaves our body, will look like a vapor. Sometimes people say it looks a little purplish, a little... Um, you know, white, blue, purple, we don't leave your, when it leaves our body. Um, there were surgeons in Vietnam. And when they got a patient in uh, basically Vietnamese patients, they didn't want to waste any, they didn't want to waste anything on them, right? Uh, medically, medical wise, like morphine or penicillin or anything like that. So if they were going to die, they would set them out at sunset and if they died at sunset, they could actually see this vapor. The surgeon wow. says that, yeah, the surgeon says that he saw it three times, three times. Three different people died in three different locations, but they would set them out at sunset and uh, they saw the soul leave the body. I mean, that's just how crazy that is. That's amazing. That's insane. Yeah. Uh, well, so oh yeah, it is. It is crazy. I mean, who, who else would be doing stuff like this? I mean, it's, no, it's, it's awesome. I mean, like, I mean, like, it's awesomely insane. Like, you know, it's it's like it's oh, yeah. really cool. Like, to, yeah. I, 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 I've never seen any. I've never had an experience. I've never seen anything. But, I, but that, I want to prove. You know, part of my po wanting to do this yeah. podcast is to prove that consciousness continues after death, and I want to prove Absolutely. it beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know, like I want to know. No what shadow happened. of a doubt. No shadow of a doubt in my mind. And you see the equation behind me, it's E equals I. And that is in proper physics right now, that is E equals I. And you can, uh, Max Planck, Einstein, and Fermi uh, argued this point forever, saying that energy equals information. And our spiritual energy is information, information. because we retain it, we retain all the memory 
that we've ever had. We Why see do we our live with this veil of forgetfulness then? But I mean, what's up with that? Okay, because the our genes, our, our biological bodies never had a spiritual experience. They were yeah. just they they were just kind of like there. And our spirit comes in, thinks that this is normal, and we just forget. We have no cellular memory of the spiritual experience until we have one. And it's like, oh yeah. Yeah, that was all normal. It's normal. It's not paranormal. It's normal. It's normal for me to, you know, die and watch other people on the planet or go to heaven or do whatever. You know, uh, there have been several books written on children that have died. And their, ne their near-death experience is like, I'm talking to an angel. And it's totally cool. And the angel says, if you reach down and pick up some clouds and you think it's uh, pistachio ice cream, then you can lick it and it'll be pistachio ice cream. And the kid would be, okay. And it was ice cream. They had ice cream cone in their hand. Because so it's like you run to the time you told me when, they, when you're dead, the universe bends to your will. That's right. The universe, even today, even in this form, is compliant to your will. It's compliant so it has to obey you to a certain extent, okay? A lot of cogs in motion, a lot of paperwork has got to be signed, but you'll get what you're thinking about. It's called, uh, what is this called? It's called? Law of attraction. Law of attraction, that's it, law of attraction. And if you start out at five years old with this law of attraction, it will happen, boom to boom. Now, is it predestined? Maybe so. Or maybe we've created our own reality and not even realize it that's 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 trippy oh yeah so if it works in their world if it works in the afterlife and we're an extension of it then it should work here as well and you hear all these miracles spontaneous healing uh all the time near-death experiences all the time and you can't but help think that there's a connection somewhere. i, I I watched this video that the researcher Billy Carson put out. He put out these people, these doctors in China. They went in to work oh. on a, a cancer patient. Yes. And they started just saying the words, wuxa, wuxa, which means like it is done. But they yeah, kept saying that in prayer over and over and over again. And it it took the tumor away. It like oh, yeah. melted. It like it was, and they and he said they went in with the idea that they were going to heal the person beforehand and it just right. worked. And that's uh, amazing. They have a preconceived idea on healing. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you right after I show you this. I'm going to talk to you about something like that. And uh, it really set, reset the way I think about possession and exorcisms. It really reset my mind. And a lot of psychologists have come across this, you know, but um, let me talk about, okay, so there's two pieces of equipment I just want to show you. And so we started out with a reel to reel, right? And so I, I felt one day I was being spied on um, or being looked at. And so I turned, I, so I was working on this piece of equipment, which is you know pretty massive. And it's my gun, uh, it's my gun thing. I have, I have two of these, but anyway, um, so I turned this on and I, and I aimed it, you know, in that direction. And sure enough, there was this mist uh, just in my lab, you know, uh, just floating down the table. And I said, oh, I got you. I got you. I spied upon you. I got you. You were spying on me. And I caught you, though. Yeah. And, and so anyway, that that entity has now become a little friend of mine, which is really cool. So so the bigger, the better in some cases, but the lighter and smaller is also works. So this is my new one. This is for next year. This is the MXL uh, 22. And what it is, is you remember the old Star Trek series, they'd have a tricorder. Yeah. Well, here is uh, two different uh, light sources and an HD infrared uh, camera. And so what you do is, let me get it there. So what you do is you flip this up and inside is a digital recorder. So you can see what you're recording. And then you, you oh, sorry, you can, you can plug in a, um, microphone to it and so you you can get you know uh, sound as well and so you you, you so you, you kind of like let me turn this around so i can turn it on you might see some lights i don't know i got my, my studio lights on so it may not 
show it. But anyway, I can turn this on and I can flip this on. Yeah, there you go. And so you can walk around with this, just like a, like a tricorder you see on the old Star Trek shows. And, um, and it will, you know, it, oh. there we go. And this is the first prototype. There we go. There we go. Anyway, it's kind of working. Anyway, so that's kind of, oh, that's kind of what it is. It's a black and white screen. You'll see it black and white because the camera is black and white. But I can record up to four hours on this, and I can walk around, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. You know, I can I can I can see the entities if they're close enough, like with in the same room, and um, and have some fun with it. I don't know why it's going a little bit odd here, but anyway. Uh, so you see there's a little TV in there and um, it's also the recorder and this is the camera and this is the light. Now I'm going to make some lights that go into the side of this so you have either, either uh, you can have a, a wider field of, of capturing and if you really get crazy you can stick this on the bottom and this is a black light and you can turn that on and there you go. You, you see inf uh, UV. So you have UV light, two infrared lights, high, de high definition um, high definition camera. And it's all being recorded. And when you're done, uh, look at that. but anyway, uh, when you're done, you just close it up and- Oh, cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you know, um, Daryl Sims, he found out that uh, you can catch, you can see the alien fluorescence on people's skin with the black light. With the UV. That's right. And I've done that. I've done that. Um, I have done that. Um, there were some abductees and they came to me and they said, you know, we need some proof that we've been abducted. And I said, well, the next time you get abducted, let me know. And uh, they did. And I went over the next day with a very big UV light and wiped it you know, uh, you know, like a wand around them and little dots started to show up like, and it was all in fluorescent, uh, fluorescence. And I said, well, where did they work on you? And this one guy said, well, they walked around, around my chest, my heart. So we opened up his shirt and sure enough, there were like little fingerprints uh, wow. around on his body. And those fingerprints came from little grays. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, we don't have much. We don't have a lot more time. Oh, because, okay, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. An hour, but um, yeah. what do we want to cover? What else do we want to cover? Because uh, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, do we want to talk about demons too? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, this this is where we're going to go. Okay, I'm sorry. Because we talked about entity consciousness. So what is a demon then? Like, how does that exist in our okay. world? Everything that uh, our emotions basically. Um, can give us the potential to be demonic, okay? So the problem becomes is, can we accept or forgive ourselves? Can we accept ourselves? Can we forgive ourselves? And if we cannot do that, we normally get locked in of shoulda, coulda, woulda. And that, um, that, that loop locks us in and becomes we become a demon unto ourselves. And we have to get rid of all that in order to really cleanly pass over. So in a hospice, when people are in hospice and they're dying, they, they, want, they need forgiveness, they need absolution. And so they can have a peace of mind when they get on the other side. And that is really what happens. When they don't get that, then they get lost in their own thinking. They get lost in their own thinking and they remain around and they can be very, very, um, male uh, malevolent in their actions because they feel like, well, I'm dead, I can do anything I want. And yet they still have some particle uh, of free will and um, they can do almost anything they want. But we have to look at, okay, the, the universe is like a hundred billion years old. There have been billions of planets uh, that have had life on them and they've all died. So uh, they are not normally may not be all evil. Yeah, they could, you know, and so that's the other thing 
they're they're lost within their own subconscious mind, their own conscious mind, and they're lost in it, and they can't get out of it. It's a loop. It's a it's the inability to forgive myself, and that's their hell. That's their hell. They can't they can't do it. So it's always good to be able to forgive people, to uh, lighten your load, lighten your heart, uh, you know, and find a peace, a zen. Uh, and I try to create a little podcast called Paranormal Zen because I wanted people to come to Zen with it. It's totally natural. It's going to happen to all of us. And the moment that it does happen, you want what's left behind out of love, uh, not out of anger or hate. And you don't want to hate yourself. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to come to that end of the road and say, oh my God, I hate myself. I, you know, I, I, you know, but it's always the last minute that they get that aha moment it's not during their lives so during their lives they need to have this idea of spirituality mindfulness and the ability to understand that they're they're going to a energetic place that their consciousness will be forever and when we reach the speed of light when your consciousness gets out of your body it goes at the speed of light so einstein said the faster you go toward the speed of light time slows down and so what happens is it slows down and you're infinite because you're energy and so wow. all your thoughts all your knowledge all your information is with you uh forever and you know what else is interesting i wanted to go over real quick with you i wanted to see sure, if you thought sure. about this uh there was a researcher an inunaki researcher that passed his name was gerald clark he did um um images of people's energy body you know like he actually have you ever heard of that of like taking yeah. images of your energy body with like yeah. um is that is, does that prove that we're energy too yes absolutely the the aura the bioelectric field that emanates from our bodies is not only by neurochemical reaction but it produces a bio aura which we call the aura and many People have practitioners have taken aura photographs. And when you have yellow aura, you have cancer. <laughs> and if you if you have a green aura, you're okay. If you have a red aura, you're you have wisdom. And now this aura changes throughout your life. And that is also a protection uh, against attachments. So if you have an entity that wants to attach itself to you, you have to balance your electromagnetic field, your personal bioelectrical field to eliminate those attachments and there have been a lot of people uh, walking around with attachments and they can jump from body to body person to person not even know it except like i said you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you become totally enraged or you have you know totally lost your senses and that could that could also be possible of a little attachment that's draining that energy from you because you have given it permission to do so. So having happy thoughts or a balanced personality is the best protection to these attachments and the best protection for you to have a, a normal and safe afterlife as well. Um, there is a doctor, I, 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 I didn't write his name down, but here it is, it's called uh, Dr. Uh, L-E-U-N-G uh, Yang Kwa. Uh, so it's Lu Yang Kwa, Y A N K W A I. Now, he changed my mind on possession. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to show you this one little thing is I was, I was at the Exorcist House live. I was there. I was the consultant for, for a lot of their information. Um, I was there and we did the, the Ronald Doe Exorcist. Uh, house now the yeah the yeah they did yeah. That, they, they did that the, the show post yeah. post the, on the, yeah. the the ghost of ronald doe or whatever right yeah right exactly and and so i live here in st louis and that's one of my major historical cases there have been several good researchers that have done uh great jobs in pulling out the data talking to the families and all that and all that information and um uh now he's in his like 80s right now he's retired and he still admits that he doesn't know anything about that, about the possession, 
He has a total blank, a total blank consciousness. And that is totally correct because why? Uh, when the entity leaves, uh, once the entity leaves, they, they take that information with them. And uh, he was truly possessed. But if you go look at this doctor, Lang Yang Kua, he feels that the body has to heal itself by getting rid of its own demons. And so he puts people into a hypnagogic state where they then have to deal with that and they have to release it. And he has traveled all over Europe, all over uh, Russia, all over England. And he's, I think he's coming to America soon. But anyway, he puts people to a hypnagogic state to where they go down deep into their souls and pull out all that hate, that debris that frustrates them and corrupts them. And he has a very good theory that the body can heal itself without drugs is just by getting rid of the bad stuff that we've accumulated over time. And I've seen his stuff and the people that go through his treatments look as if they are been possessed. The only thing they don't do is speak in a foreign language, but, and they don't levitate. They don't levitate, they don't speak in a foreign language, but the strength, the uh, reaction, uh, all of that, all of that looks like the person is possessed because they're trying to free this baggage, this garbage that, that their soul has collected throughout their life. And there, there, one amazing story about this is that there was a, a gentleman on heroin. He had, he had to have heroin every day. He was, a, he was an addict. He went to a session. In one session, after the session, he no longer had the addiction. In two sessions, he was totally straight. And by the third session, he said, I'm going to be a disciple of you and follow you wherever you go. And that is almost exactly a quote right out of the Bible when Jesus uh, <laughs> got legion, you know, got put legion into the pigs, into the swine. And that guy said, you know, master, he goes, I will be your disciple. I'll go. And then Jesus says, no, go on your way. You've been saved. You've been cleansed, cleansed, cleansed. Now, if you look at the healing hand that came out a few years ago, and also the power of prayer and all these other books, you start looking at transmission and reception from the human body, but it comes from the subconscious psyche, the subconscious psyche that has to open the door to allow this to happen. So if you look up uh, Loeng Yang Kua, PhD, he's all over YouTube. It will, if you're a paranormal investigator, if you're a parapsychologist, you will be shocked because these people look like zombies. They look like possessed people right out of the textbook, except they don't speak foreign languages and they don't levitate. But then again, I found some other mystics who claim that they can levitate. And, uh, and that's interesting. I, I, I've never been there. I've seen the videos, you know, and I know a lot about special effects. Uh, uh, but I, I can't agree to that. But anyway, but this other guy dead on and it freaks you out how fast the brain can change when it's stimulated in the proper way. And this goes back to EEGs when people were putting electrodes in people's heads and they were like having near death experiences and they were seeing stuff and all they were act like they were leaving their body. Yeah. Well, why not? Because the brain is the buffer of our reality. You change the brain, your reality changes, whether it's biochemical, bioelectrical, um, a sporting event, adrenaline, you know, hormones, endorphins, uh, synapses. I can go right down the list. If those things change, it changes you, your personality and your perception. So amazing. What if you are holding a grudge? I hate somebody. I am holding that grudge. That grudge becomes toxic. Now there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people out there that said that cancer is started by hating yourself or unable to get rid of some angst. And man, I'll tell you, I'm the guy from 1969 with a guitar and long hair and I got angst, but you know, I wear blue jeans. You know. But the deal is that <laughs> you've got to get rid of all that. You've got to get rid of it. And I'm not saying take a yoga class. I'm not saying do all that stuff. But reach down inside of you and say, is this the best version of myself? 
you know, is this the best, how do I get rid of all this extra garbage and be the best version of myself? And no matter who you talk to, Paul, Peter, Jesus, uh, or uh, near-death experiencers, they all come back. And the first thing, there was a guy named Tom Sawyer, and a, a car fell on his chest, killed him. And, um, and he's, he, when he came back, he was the most calm. It was, his personality like totally changed. He was so calm and so forgiving and so loving. And they said, well, why, why is this, cha this change happened to you? And he goes, because I know that's where I want to go in that loving environment. And every near-death experiencer, except for a handful, yeah, they all go to hell, you know, they all talk about it. But even Daniel Brinkley, who went to the Marines, and he was a nasty SOB, claims himself there was no reason for him to go where he went. He says, by his book, you know, judging himself, um, he says, he goes, you know, but he says, once I got over there, he goes, uh, he goes, they didn't bring it up. And I sure was going to ask about it. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so, so we have a, a point of view, but the, the main point is the mind and the spirit need to relax. Yeah, exactly. And then that prevents the demons that prevents the attachments that prevents so much in the paranormal world. Um, you know, that it's just, uh, it's, it's, you know, I would call it like, like, a, like a cleansing. You, you go through a cleanse. Like, you know, you need, you need detox. You drink yeah. uh, juice to clean out your liver and stuff like that. There is Chinese uh, Shaolins that say it's all in our minds. The soul and the mind are like in this intertwined. Chi. Right, they're intertwined in this chi. And if the mind and the soul are congruent you're not fighting anything you don't hate anything if you just find that equal pattern that taoist feel that feng shui then it will become easier and you'll start to see it um you know we all have a lot of questions like why does god do what he does and why do people have to die and all this other stuff because in the end game that's that's the reason why we're here and that's the way he made us yeah so we can't change physics but we can change our reality our perception of reality and our understanding of reality and the and the first thing you have to understand is that it's energy your mind is energy your soul is energy and your body reacts to that your body becomes compliant so everything you hate deep down your body hates too you see what i'm saying yeah. so like i said a lot of people uh if they could get to this earlier, they would they wouldn't have the diseases, the MS, the the uh, fibromyalgia, the, the the cancers. You know, uh, they wouldn't have it uh, yeah. if they could just find that chi and balance that with their soul or this the the the, the mind chi energy uh, balance. Now I know this sounds kind of new agey, but you know it's no, been it's, it's since the eighties. You know what I'm saying? But um, we, we've been going a while that we, oh, we I'm we, sorry, we, I don't know what time it is. Can we wrap it up and can we yeah. can you can you come back again? Because oh, I absolutely. love talking to you, man. Like I could yeah. talk to you forever. Yeah, I, I, I we've got so much more ground to cover, but the deal is is that we've got to have a paradigm shift. We have to we have to change fundamentally the way we look at our reality and then say, okay, maybe it's not the greatest, but that's not bad. It's not bad, okay. We can always make it better. We have the potential to build a bigger, better America, a bigger, better, whatever you want to do. And, I'm, and, I, and uniquely in this country, we have the freedoms to do that. Whoever is president and whoever, blah, 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 you know, who's ever on the front page, who cares? What, what you should be concerned about is I'm going to go to a place of love and I want to be as loving as I can to get there. Yeah. And where, yeah. Can you tell people where to find you and I do oh, your podcast yeah. or anything like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I'm on the internet. Uh, I'm on Facebook. You can look me up under Facebook. I, got, I met a few good friends um, that I haven't seen in a long time. And they're like, wow, this is really cool. So you go to Facebook, type in Michael Lynch, PhD. I'm there. And I'm also on YouTube. And you go to, I think it's Michael Lynch. I don't think I have a, a PhD on that one. And type in Michael Lynch and look for this symbol right here, the E equals I, or um, exterior forces. 
And I made a mini series uh, called Exterior Forces because of how the universe affects us. But what I ended up doing was actually reversing it and how we affect the universe. And we can affect it with our minds, our creativity, our, our interest, you know, our, and our desire to go into uh, areas um, that no one's ever been before. Uh, back in the old days, there was a call, and I don't know if everyone got this, but in the old Star Trek, it was to boldly go where no man's gone before. And in the, 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 it was a question, you know, it wasn't a statement. It was like, are you prepared to go boldly where no one's gone before? And that is, that's the, that's the thing that you have to throw down and say, you know, how is my life going? And have I been where I've never been before? And that's where you, what you have to focus on. And, and sometimes it's internal, you know, sometimes it's very internal. And then sometimes it's external. And um, that's the best way I can, that's the best way I can describe it at this time. But, that, that, that was, this was amazing, man. I'd love to do your work. Yeah. But like, I just want to say is one thing, the paranormal is no longer this bastard child hanging out someplace. It is deep into regular physics uh, with this equation. And because we didn't understand that, it's because we didn't have the equation of consciousness, which I developed. So this equation is in physics. Anyone can look it up. And it's, it's substructure is in the basis of our reality because it's a crystalline nature. So our reality is crystalline. So what? It's receiving information and the crystals give us the, the information, the refined information. So the, the nuclei in a cell is a crystalline sh a shape. Cells talk to each other, cell to cell. Um, our consciousness can talk to them. Uh, we can, you know, if some people are telepathic, they can talk to each other. It's just the internet. We created exactly our brain in the internet. It, and so we're all now connected, but it was something that we already had in our brain. We just had to get there. We just had to make that paradigm leap in order to get there. So in the 21st century, we can now build on this and go where no one has gone before. That's amazing. We'll yeah. end it with that. And uh, we got to do this again. You're my favorite researcher, man. I love talking to you. Like, yeah. I, I could yeah, talk I, for hours. Hey, I don't know. I'm not sure where you're located, but I'm in St. Louis. So anytime you want to take a road trip, message me on Facebook and, and we'll sit down and, you know, I will pull up some lawn chairs in my backyard and we'll see all the ghosts you want to see. That's awesome. I'm in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I'm not that far. So, yeah. Okay. All okay. Right. Have Make a good it a night. Day. Hey, good night. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dr. Lynch.